Welcome everyone to today's uh, class on financial risk management. Last week we stopped um, after having talked about the potential stochastic processes we could use for the underlying price, aka the stock. And we've now come to the point where we want to generalize uh, the Brownian motion a little bit and the diffusion process. So this is the definition of a general diffusion process. That is, the change in the underlying price is given by a function A that has as variables the stock price itself and point T times the change in time dt plus a function B, also a function in S and T, um, times the Wiener process, the change dW in the Wiener process. And we know that the standard Wiener process is nothing but a process with normally distributed independent increments. So this is where here in the end dW is given by um, the square root of the change in time dt times this random variable x. This random variable x stays constant and it stays constantly equal to the standard normal distribution. Okay. If in any case, we simplify this to have a drift mu and a diffusion sigma, then it's only a special case of the general diffusion process. Okay. A geometric Brownian motion. <coughs> what is a geometric Brownian motion? Very simply, a geometric Brownian motion is ic given explicitly by st. Uh, equals st0 times the exponential function of mu minus half sigma squared and so on and so on. The interesting notation is actually this one. The change in the underlying price is given by mu s dt plus sigma s dw. So if you multiply the process itself into the drift and the diffusion, then you'll get a geometric Brownian motion. If you were to leave out this here and this here, this would again be the, gym, uh, the Brownian motion. Now, <clears throat> if we set mu equal to uh, m equal to mu minus sigma squared um, divided by 2, this implies that the change in the logarithm of st is given by m dt plus sigma dwt. And this is what I meant with this. Um, fact that the stock price is usually modeled using a geometric Brownian motion. And if you look at this here, this is the difference in the logarithmic price, aka log return, stetige log rendite, die stetige rendite. And we again get a Brownian motion or a Wiener process, a diffusion process for the log return. And the two are equivalent. Assuming a geometric Brownian motion for the stock prices or a Brownian motion for the log returns is um, it's the same. And never have we assumed at any point a normal distribution. We've only assumed a geometric Brownian motion or a Brownian motion, so a specific stochastic process for the underlying price or for the log returns. And the normal distribution is a result of this assumption. So this is quite interesting compared to the usual way it is described in German textbooks. ASCII follows a geometric Brownian motion. Changes in stock prices thus satisfy dst equals mu st dt plus sigma st dwt. The log returns follow a Brownian motion. And if we were in discrete time, and we were to take the difference in discrete time, this would simply be the difference L n s t minus L n s t minus 1. So this would give you immediately the log, the log return between two points in time. And as a result, we have the underlying price, s t. We assume a geometric Brownian motion. And this leads us to log normally distributed prices and log returns that are normally distributed. So if you ever see the assumption of log returns being normally distributed, and we'll see this all the time in finance, 
In fact, the assumption of the model is a geometric Brownian motion for the stock prices and nothing else. So keep this in mind. Now, an important question now is, what do we do with this? We have a very nice um, statistically appealing model for the stock prices, but this whole chapter is about option pricing. So we'll need um, to look at a function f in S and T. Why? Because the option price, if we take, for example, the price of a put, the option price is a function of the, of the current uh, underlying price. And of course, we know the current underlying price, so that's not, uh, not a variable. But the, stock the put price will depend on future stock prices and the point in time we are currently at. So for a put, this is a function in the underlying price and time. Same for a call, same for a barrier option, same for an Asian option. So any option price is a function in ST and T. And this is important to note here. And this is important to remember for you. Um, any option price, any derivative price, is such a function F in ST and T. Any derivatives price is a function in the underlying price and in time t. So what we are looking for is the stochastic behavior of df, a change in the underlying price, uh, in the option price, in the derivative price. Remember, dst is a change in the underlying price, but we are now looking at dft, a change in the derivative price that is induced by a change in the underlying price. Quite clear. Yeah, we are looking at derivative, and that's a that's a function. <clears throat> now this is where it gets tricky. Um, we need Ito's lemma. There's a lemma from Ito. Um, first of all, we do a Taylor transformation. What is a Taylor transformation and a Taylor expansion, representation, representation of a function using its Taylor series? Now, go back to your math classes. Um, horrible nightmares will probably come to your mind. Uh, and one of the one of the most beautiful results in calculus uh, in analysis is Taylor's theorem. Taylor's theorem states that under certain assumptions, continuity, differentiability, you can take a function f and you can replace it by its Taylor series. And the Taylor series is a polynomial that is given by certain coefficients that are calculated on the basis of the function derivatives and x minus point a, x minus a, squared x minus a to the third and so on and the result is that at least in a small vicinity of a given point a the function can be replaced by its taylor series and we call this a taylor expansion and a taylor rein erweiterung you know, a taylor rein entwicklung you know, taylor expansion why is it called a taylor expansion because you can substitute any function you do not know and that might be quite complicated by its very simple Taylor series. And at some point, because the Taylor series, as the name implies, is an infinite series, you can cut off all those higher elements of the Taylor series and you get a Taylor approximation of order one, of order two, of order three. And you do the same here. And not surprisingly, you get something that includes partial derivatives. Ich erzähle das nochmal auf Deutsch, weil das üblicherweise die Stelle ist, wo die meisten auschecken. Ich überwinde ich etwas. Sie kennen aus der Analyse sicherlich noch den Satz von Taylor. Der Satz von Taylor besagt, dass Sie bei einer differenzierbaren Funktion die Funktion f selber ersetzen können in einer unbekannten, möglicherweise sehr kleinen Umgebung eines Punktes durch die Taylor-Reihe. Das nennt man dann eine Taylor-Reihenentwicklung. Was ist die Taylor-Reihe? Die Taylor-Reihe nochmal auf die Basics zurückzukommen, eine Reihe ist eine unendliche Summe. 
Und die Taylor-Reihe sieht besonders aus, nämlich die Koeffizienten sind gegeben letztlich durch die Ableitung. Ne? Erste Ableitung, zweite Ableitung, dritte Ableitung und dann so weiter, bis, bis es halt irgendwann 0 wird. Und diese Koeffizienten werden multipliziert mit x minus dem Punkt a, x minus dem Punkt a zum Quadrat, x minus dem Punkt a hoch 3, hoch 4, hoch 5 und so weiter. Und das geht bis ins Endliche. Wenn Sie aber immer nur so Klammerausdrücke x minus einen Punkt haben, also x minus 3, x minus 3 zum Quadrat, x minus 3 hoch 3 und so weiter, ist das, was am Ende rauskommt, summiert natürlich ein Polynom. Das ist das Taylor-Polynom. Erstmal eine unendliche Reihe. Theoretisch geht es bis in unendliche Höhe. Und wenn Sie dann einfach sagen, nach fünf Termen schneide ich ab, den Rest vernachlässige ich, ist das eine taylor rein approximation Dritter Ordnung, vierte Ordnung, fünfte Ordnung, sechste Ordnung. Sehr simpel, lernt jeder im ersten, zweiten Semester in der Analysis. Nichts anderes wird hier gemacht. Sie nehmen diese Funktion f und Sie schauen sich im Grunde genommen das totale Differential an und ersetzen dann hier mit einer taylor rein entwicklung setzen das alles. What we need to see first is, this is an exact equation, and you can see it includes an awful lot of partial derivatives of the function f with respect to time and with respect to the underlying price. And at some point, we can summarize all the remaining terms that have dt squared or dt to the third power to the fourth power and so on and higher powers in it. And because the change in time, and we are in continuous time, dt is infinitesimally small, if you square it, it will be even smaller and close to zero. So what we are doing now is, we've expanded this function here using the Taylor transformation, and at the end, we'll simply assume that everything that, in, that includes dt squared, dt to the third power, dt to the fourth power, and so on, can be neglected. Alle Terme mit dt Quadrat oder höher werden einfach weggelassen, weil die Veränderungen, sie will, sind in stetiger Zeit und wir betrachten schon nur infinitesimal kleine Zeitveränderungen. Und wenn Sie etwas, was nah bei Null liegt, quadrieren, ist das noch näher bei Null und dann können Sie es auch gleich Null setzen. Und das tun Sie hier und dementsprechend sehen Sie dann Itos Lemma, sagt eben einfach, Sie können das in stetiger Zeit alles, was danach folgt, hier vernachlässigen. Then the following applies. The expectation of dw squared is dt. And thus the variance of dw squared is close to dt squared. Why? We don't care. We don't need this. We only need to use it. So, dt squared in linear approximation, again, if dt is very small, if we square it, it will be even smaller and close to zero. So, let's just assume that this is zero. If something is, has a variance of zero, it is no longer random, it is deterministic. But if it's deterministic, It is equal to its expectation. Die Zufallsvariable mit Varianz 0 kann gleich dem Erwartungswert gesetzt werden, weil das ist dann die Variable, es ist gar keine Zufallsvariable mehr. So, dw squared is close to dt. Almost. And with this, if we take the square root, dw becomes square root of dt, and if we ignore all values with higher powers of dt, one finally gets Ito's lemma. And this one is famous. And we can immediately turn to the lower one with mu and sigma for the drift and uh, diffusion. A change in any function in a diffusion process, s and time, is given by The partial derivative of f with respect to s times mu plus the partial derivative of f with respect to time plus half diffusion squared times the second partial derivative with respect to um, the underlying price times dt 
plus the partial derivative of f with respect to s times sigma times dw. And it means that this here can simply be written as, let's call it mu star dt plus sigma star dw. And Ito's lemma's result is that the time evolution, the stochastic behavior of any function in the diffusion process is another diffusion process with slightly different parameters. And by the way, it's also called the Ito process, but we don't need that. And as you can see, we now have to deal with partial derivatives. We'll come back to this later, but this, these partial derivatives also have an economic interpretation. Okay, so we know from Ito's lemma, if we assume a geometric Brownian motion for the underlying price, for the stock price, the option price is again a diffusion process with slightly different drift and slightly drift, uh, different diffusion. Now, can even be further reduced to this here, but let's just stick with the other one. And we can now come up finally with the Black Scholes pricing formula. Again, got the authors the Nobel Prize in economics. Let's specify the value of a derivative on an underlying S at time t by V. That's the value of the derivative. It now follows the process DST, the general diffusion process. I'll put this here in brackets. We don't really need this. We can look at percentages. We can look at changes in percentages. Then we have to slightly adjust for the drift and the diffusion. But we'll start with a general diffusion process for the underlying, and we're looking at the value of the derivative. Now, the value of the derivative, V, is again a diffusion process. And this here comes from Ito's lemma. We know the drift and we know the diffusion of the um, stochastic process for the derivative price. And we need to calculate the partial derivatives of the option price. We don't know that yet, but it will turn up later. Now, at this point, this representation of Ito's lemma, it may sound somewhat less compelling. Why? We are only talking about a function f, a function in the underlying price. The nice thing is um, we can now look at changes in the underlying price. And I'll come back to this later, but there is a reason why we are speaking of a very general function f in the underlying price, why we are speaking of one derivative. And it's interesting to see that um, in this model, the derivative price is nothing but simply a function in the underlying price. It's just f of s, that's it. Let's get a little bit more economic. Let's have a more economic intuition. We'll construct a portfolio that consists of the derivative and a number delta of underlines. So one option, for example, plus a number of underlines, but as a short position. So pi, there's a capital pi here. Pi is one derivative, V, minus delta S. And delta is the number of underlines we need to go short to include in this portfolio. So derivative long plus underlying short. The change of the portfolio value is given by d pi, and that is simply the change in the derivative price minus the change in the price of the underlying. So dv minus delta ds. Ito's lemma comes into play. We know dv, and 
we need to rearrange this a little bit. Now, let's look at this line here. The next step is to make this portfolio great again. No, to make this portfolio risk-free. How can we make this portfolio risk-free? Risikolos. Well, it's risk-free if the change in the price, if the change in the portfolio value, d pi, if d pi is no longer random, if it's deterministic. And then it's quite simple to see what is deterministic and what is stochastic. The only thing that is stochastic is this year, ds, the change in time, well, we know that tomorrow will be one day ahead from now. So this here is deterministic, this here is deterministic. The only thing that is stochastic is the latter part with ds, the change in the underlying price. And when does this term become zero? Well, obviously, if, if this partial derivative is equal to delta, the number of underlines in our portfolio. So if we want, if we have a derivative in our portfolio, and we want to fully hatch this portfolio, we need to go short in the underlying, and we need to select the number of underlines equal to the partial derivative of the option price, of the derivative price, with respect to the underlying price. This is what is called a delta hedge. This is a delta hedge, you see on the next slide. So to hedge the portfolio value to zero, to make a full hedge, you need to choose the number of underlines you're short equal to this partial derivative. And this is why we've already shown this to be delta, and this is what we call a delta hedge. It's a perfect hedge. The resulting portfolio will be risk-free. It will not have a lower risk, just a lower risk, but it will be risk-free. And this is a delta hedge. Now with a delta hedge, this portfolio is risk-free. Meaning that in an, on an arbitrage-free complete market, and that is one of our critical assumptions here, that the market for derivatives and the financial market is arbitrage-free, there cannot be two prices for one good. And if this portfolio is risk-free, and we have a risk-free investment, both should have the same interest rate. So this portfolio, if it is hedged, if it is risk-free, it should give the risk-free rate. So del dp and no, d pi should equal r times pi times dt. Interest rate, the risk-free interest rate r times the amount of money we've invested in the portfolio pi times the change in time we are looking at. So let's say 5% times 1,000 euros times three months. That should be our return, and that's d pi. And at this point, you should realize what we have included in this model. Assumption of a geometric Brownian motion. We need an Ito's lemma. We have an arbitrage-free market. Thus, we have a risk-free rate. We have delta hedged the portfolio consisting of the underlyings and the derivative. And on an arbitrage-free market, a delta hedge portfolio consisting of the derivative and underlines should give you the risk-free rate. And you're done. And everything that follows is simply a combination of this. We have, from our assumption of the geometric Brownian motion, we know the change in the option derivative price. Then let's all combine this and you will come up with this. And this is the black scholes differential equation, the black scholes differential gleichung. The black scholes differential equation for a portfolio of one option or a derivative and the number of underlines is simply given by partial derivative with respect to time plus half times diffusion parameter times squared underlying price times the second derivative 
of the option price, derivative price with respect to the underlying plus risk-free rate times S times the partial derivative minus risk-free rate minus the value of the portfolio. Now, it states that for arbitrage reasons, the return per time from a delta H portfolio must be equal to the return per time of a risk-free investment in the same amount of the portfolio value. Okay. That's the black scholes differential equation. Let's go through all the assumptions we've made. We have a log normal random walk or a geomet geometric Brownian motion for the underlying price. We have a risk-free interest rate. It's a function of time, comparatively uncritical. We haven't spoken about dividends. That's okay. We can do delta hedging at no cost in continuous time. That one's critical. If you try to delta hedge all the time, you will incur transaction costs. So in a real market, in a realistic market, this will not be possible. But here in our model assumption, delta hedging is continuously possible um, and we have no arbitrage and no transaction costs. So these are the critical model assumptions. Now, differential equations. Let me ask around who of you does not know what a differential equation is? Wer von Ihnen weiß nicht, was eine Differentialgleichung ist? Sie wissen das alle. Dann wissen Sie mehr als ich in meinem BWL-Studium. Haben Sie alle schon mal Differentialgleichungen gesehen? Keiner traut sich. Okay. Ich erkläre es trotzdem. Differential Equations as the name suggests, are equations in which you have derivatives of a function and you're not looking for the solution in the form of a number, but for a solution in the form of a, of a function. A differential equation is solved by a function f or a function y. So let's say we'll substitute, we'll write f of x as y, and the, probably the simplest um, example for a differential equation is this. Y is the derivative of Y. Can you give me the solution for this differential equation? This is an ordinary differential equation. Eine gewöhnliche Differentialgleichung, weil sie beinhaltet nur ist nur in einer Variable und beinhaltet keine partiellen Ableitungen, dann hätten wir nämlich eine partielle Differentialgleichung. Can you see the solution to this differential equation? Anyone? The solution is y equal to the exponential function. If you take the exponential function, if you calculate its first derivative, the derivative is again equal to y. So this is the solution. No one? There are more than one solution. Can you give me a second solution? This one is also a solution. If you take the zero function and calculate its first derivative, the derivative of zero is again zero, so again the function itself. So this is a second solution. And as you can see, in many cases, differential equations have infinite solutions. And you need to single out one solution by setting a boundary condition. Gewöhnliche, auch partielle Differentialgleichungen haben üblicherweise eine unendlich große Lösungsmenge an Funktionen. Und Sie müssen dann über eine Randwertbedingung, eine Anfangs- oder Endwertbedingung, eine Lösung auswählen. Wie können Sie das tun? In diesem Beispiel können Sie nämlich sagen, y ist gleich y' und y von 0 ist gleich 1. Dann ist in dem Fall klar, das kann nicht mehr die Nullfunktion sein, sondern ist dann eindeutig die Exponentialfunktion. This is how differential equations work. They are equations, they include derivatives of a function, 
a solution to a uh, differential equation is usually an infinite set of functions and you need to make additional assumptions on starting or terminal values to make sure that you get a unique solution. Same here. Only in this case, this is not an ordinary differential equation. It's a stochastic partial differential equation. It's an SPDE. It's stochastic, obviously, because we are, we are working with random variables. It's a partial differential equation and a partielle differential gleichung because it includes partial derivatives, partielle ableitung, and it's a differential equation. So it's an SPDE. And, well, we need to solve this. We are looking, we are still looking for the pricing function. Wir suchen noch die Preisfunktion für die Option oder für das Derivat. And for this, we need additional assumptions. We need to fix some of the values of this function. Genauso wie wir jetzt hier gesagt haben, y0 ist 1, müssen wir jetzt noch bestimmte Werte der Funktion festlegen, weil ansonsten haben wir immer noch eine unendliche Lösungsmenge. And what is so easy in this case? How can we fix those boundary conditions? What do we choose as boundary conditions? Just read through the slide. It's a payout profile. We know what the derivative pays out at maturity. At capital T, when the option expires or is very close to expiration, well, we know what the option pays out. And this is our terminal value condition. Die Option, jedes Derivat hat doch ein Auszahlungsprofil am Ende. Wenn ich am Ende bin, weiß ich, ich bekomme zum Beispiel ein Maximum aus S minus K oder 0. Und das Auszahlungsprofil ist dann die Endwertbedingung, um hoffentlich diese Differentialgleichung eindeutig lösen zu können. That's the, it's actually not the initial, it's the terminal value condition, Endwertbedingung. So VST at capital T, this is important here, is simply the payout profile. And remember, for a call, this was given by the maximum of S T minus K or zero. In that case, we would let the option expire. Now, we have this differential equation. We know that we can set the boundary condition equal to the derivatives payout profile. And this is where we ask our colleagues from mathematical physics and they will tell us that if we have this type of partial derivative, a partial differential equation, and if we have a function um, p that is the payout profile, the, this is close or exactly the same as what is called in physics the heat equation or the diffusion equation, the hits, the Wärmeleitungsgleichung oder die Diffusionsgleichung. Damit können Sie in der Physik beschreiben, wie, wenn Sie, Sie nehmen, einen, einen, nehmen mal Stahl, Sie nehmen ein Rohr mit Stahl, massiv, auch an der einen Stelle fangen Sie an, das zu erhitzen, dann stellt sich die Frage, wie sich die Wärme, wie die Wärme durch das Material gleitet, in Abhängigkeit von Widerstand und Wärmeleitungsfähigkeit und was nicht allem. Das wird in der mathematischen Physik beschrieben mit der Wärmeleitungsgleichung. Das ist das gleiche wie hier, ähm, Diffusion, äh, Diffusionsgleichung hatte ich Ihnen ja erklärt, deswegen nennt sie das ja Diffusionsprozess. Das ist die, das, das physikalische Modell, dass Sie zum Beispiel eine Flüssigkeit in Ihr Aquarium schmeißen oder kippen und dann verteilt sich das eben. Oder durch eine Membran durchgleiten lassen, Gase, eine Gas durch, das, durch eine Membran in ein anderes Gas einleiten, dann verteilen sich die Moleküle auch zufällig nach dem Diffusionsmodell. So we don't need to solve this. Mathematicians have done this for us and this is the solution. Exponential function divided by diffusion times square root of 2 pi times the remaining maturity times an integral. Integral from 0 to infinity of yada, 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 p. And the integral is done with respect to ds. This is the exact solution. You don't need to memorize this because in, at this point we are not smarter than before. Because then this here 
instead of solving for the um, instead of solving for the differential equation, we've now uh, we've now come to the point where we need to solve an incredibly difficult integral. Okay, what can we do? Let's use a specific example. Let's use a plain vanilla call. In this case, plain vanilla call is a maximum of s minus k or zero. So let's put it in here. So the pricing function v for the derivative is yada 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 yada. The only difference is now that this here, the zero becomes k, and this here is s minus k. So by using this plain vanilla call, we get a slightly different integral. And if you now split it into two, if you note that the integrals actually, you cannot solve for them, but you simply realize, wait a second, they look exactly like the, con uh, the cumulative distribution function, the Verteilungsfunktion of a normal distribution, well, you're done. And this is the result. The option price, the derivative price, V, is S times phi of V1 minus strike minus continuous compounding factor. Also, absence of disk. No, this is. Uh, this should be a compounding. Aufzinsungs factor. Times. No, discount factor. Times phi of D2 d1 and d2 given by this but this is usually the point uh, in in most textbooks this will not be equation 29 this will be equation one it will tell you black scholes model assumption one two three four five this is the pricing formula it will simply drop from heaven and you will would be told well if you want to use the black scholes model use this formula and you can now at first see how we've come to this point assumption of a geometric Brownian motion Ito's lemma uh, derivative price is a function in the underlying price uh, we look at a portfolio we use a delta hedge to make it risk-free in an arbitrage free market it will give you the risk-free rate uh, we'll get the black scholes differential equation the differential equation cannot be solved directly. Um, we need to make further assumptions. We need to set as a boundary condition the payout profile of the derivative. And in this particular case of a plain European vanilla call, plain, plain vanilla European call, we get this pricing formula. <laughs> and, well, you should now see that it's no big surprise that if you assume a geometric Brownian motion, aka something related to the normal distribution, what comes out of the model at the end is something related to the normal distribution. So this is no surprise. But this is the pricing formula for the black scholes model, for a plain vanilla European call. For a put, also analytical solution, now it's minus S, phi minus v1 plus k times exponential function times phi minus v2. For a digital call, a digital call is something very simple. It simply means you have this strike. If the stock price goes up, you get one euro. If it goes down, you get nothing. So instead of the difference, you will always get one euro. That's why it's called a digital call. You will only get one regardless of how far the underlying price exceeds this strike. And in this case, as you can see here, the black scolds price is even simpler. It's very simple. It's simply phi of d2 times the exponential function. Okay. Now, um, we have seen the black scolds pricing formula for a digital call, a plain vanilla call, and a plain vanilla put. And here, as you can see, it all depends on the payout profile P. 
if you were to insert, if you were to plug in the payout profile of a more complicated option, it might be that you would need to stop at this point here. That you would not be able to come up with the analytical solution of the black scholes differential equation just like we were able to in the case of a plain vanilla call. And this is where we make the um, different, where we differentiate between plain vanilla and exotic options. Plain vanilla options are those for which we can solve the black scholes differential equation. That's why they are called plain vanilla, because we get an analytical solution in this, on this slide here. If we do not get an analytical solution, if there is no black scholes price, then it's an exotic option. Why? Because we don't have a black scholes pricing formula. That is one thing you need to know. The second related remark here is that regardless of whether it's a plain vanilla call or plain vanilla, a plain vanilla option or an exotic option, the modeling framework is always the same. It is always the Black Scholes framing, uh, pricing framework. The only difference is that for the plain vanilla options, the plain vanilla derivatives, Black Scholes formula is available. For the exotic ones, you need other methods to solve this. But you can still use this result here. You only need to come up with a different method of solving for this integral. You need to approximate this integral. But it's still the Black Scholes pricing framework. It's still the Black Scholes model. Second remark. And last but not least, it is such a beautiful model because right until the end, we have not fixed the derivative. It all comes down to PS. But PS, the payout profile in um, the payout profile as a function in the underlying price can be a future, an option, a digital call, it can be an Asian option, it can be anything. Any derivative can be priced via Black Scholes. And if you ever see a German textbook that tells you, yeah, you can use for option pricing, you can use the Black Scholes, and here you can use it for a call or a put. No, you can use it for any derivative. Why? Because as you have seen here, the model only assumes the derivative price to be any function f in the underlying price. We have never, throughout the whole model, made any assumption on the derivative. It remains any function f in s. It is only a matter of computational complexity. It might be that it's very easy that we have a formula. It might be that you are forced, well, that you're forced to make an approximation to this integral. Sag es nochmal schön auf Deutsch, weil das wichtig ist, oder mir ist zumindest wichtig, es kann sein, dass wir es anders sehen. Ähm, Sie sollten bitte verstehen, dass dieses, dieses, um dieses Modell zu verstehen ähm, und auch zu verstehen, warum man dafür einen Nobelpreis bekommen hat, ist es eben einfach wichtig zu sehen, dass zum einen das eine geniale Idee war, einfach sehr vieles aus der mathematischen Physik zu nehmen und auf die, äh, auf, auf die Finanzwirtschaft zu übertragen. Das Zweite ist, ähm, in sehr vielen, und das meine ich nicht irgendwie ähm, übertrieben, in fast allen deutschen Lehrbüchern wird Ihnen nur die Endformel ähm, hier am Ende präsentiert und dann wird Ihnen gesagt, und damit können Sie einen Call und einen Put bepreisen. Nein, Sie können damit alles bepreisen. Es ist am Ende nur eine Frage, ob Sie es ausrechnen können. Für Plain Vanilla Optionen haben sie diese Formel gegeben in der einen oder anderen Version. Wenn hier aber eine exotische Option reingeht, ist das Auszahlungsprofil P dergestalt, dass sie das Integral nicht mehr analytisch, sprich also auf dem Papier, lösen können. Und dann können sie nur noch hergehen und sie können mit dem Computer, mit brachialer Rechenpower, können sie probieren, das Integral zu lösen. Sieht ja auch nicht leicht aus, muss man ja auch dazu geben. Ne? dann können Sie nur noch mit, mit, mit Brute Force, mit Rechenpower, können Sie das Integral in die Knie zwingen und eine Näherungslösung bestimmen. Das ist dann das, was häufig immer als Monte Carlo Simulation bezeichnet wird. Das werden wir noch sehen. Das Black Scholes Modell ist 
so generisch und allgemein, wie es nur geht. Es spricht nur von irgendeinem Derivat, dessen Preis eine Funktion im Underlying Preis und in der Zeit ist. Und wir haben nie eine Annahme getroffen, die jetzt spezifisch wäre für eine spezielle Art von Option. Gut. Das sollten Sie sich merken. Nebenbei, ähm, das an der Stelle gehen wir dann auch noch stärker in, im Master in Computational Finance auf ein, weil da wird es dann, wird's dann so ein bisschen spannender, wie man den Rechen wie man die Rechenkraft des Computers einsetzt, um das dann berechnen zu können in den Fällen, wo sie keine einfachen Optionen mehr haben. Okay. Any questions concerning the Black Scholes model? Okay, if you have no questions, then let's continue. Let's do option pricing using binomial model. The binomial model is quite simple. It assumes a change in the underlying price The underlying price can go up, it can go down with a certain probability and then we'll use a discretization of time in say n steps and at any point in time the underlying price can go up, it can go down and what will result is something that looks like this. and so on, and then we'll have potential underlying prices, and based on these potential underlying prices, we'll compute potential option prices, go back in time, and compute what, on average, the price of the option should be today. And then, an, a natural extension of the binomial model is the trinomial model, then you have three states, up, down, and it stays the same, up, down and so on. That's a trinomial model. Also very simple. I will implement this in MATLAB code. Um, you don't need to be aware of MATLAB code. It's quite simple to understand, but if you want to use it in MATLAB or Octave, which is the freeware uh, variant of MATLAB, you're free to do so. But it's easier to show it in, in MATLAB code um, so that you can see how actually this works. Um, you can read about this in the textbook by Branding. You don't need this. Uh, I don't think we have too many copies in the library and this one is very expensive. It costs about 200 euros, so don't, don't buy it. But it's a good textbook. Um, so starting point is a financial market and we have a stock that can be in two states, up or down. It's a one-period state space market. The market initially includes a risk-free investment with an interest rate R. In addition, we have a stock with an initial value of S. At the end, it can go up and go down, and this will be noted by SU and SD. S up, S down. Now, first, we'll take a very simple result. Um, for an arbitrage free state space market. Given any financial security with return CI, uh, C1 and C2 at time T1, the arbitrage free value V0 of the financial security is given by C1 times Q plus C1 times 1 minus Q, uh, discounted with 1 plus R, and Q is given by 1 plus R minus D divided by U minus D. Um, At this point, I would ask you if you will, if you want to know why you come up with this, please look at my textbook, Unternehmerische Finanzierungspolitik. And you can also look it up on the internet, but uh, it's quite simple to show that on a risk with a risk-free rate um, in a state space market like this, with one period state space market and two future cash flows, C1 and C2, you can show that you can take the probability up and down and you, you have to change it, and this in the end looks like risk-neutral pricing. So we'll duplicate the financial security with a portfolio consisting of the risk-free investment and the stock. Now let's do this. Small example from the textbook by Albrecht and Maurer. The risk-free interest rate is 10%. Current price of the stock is 100. At point one, the price can be 
125 or 80. And now let's consider a put option. So we can sell at the current strike, which is the underlying price. We can sell at 100. Now the possible payouts are shown on the next slide. Stock goes up 125 or goes down 80. And the put will pay out 0 or 20. Depending on the underlying price going up or down. So we'll have 0 or 20. Now, we do a duplication strategy. We duplicate the payouts of the option. This is the put. And we duplicate it in both states with a portfolio that consists of the underlying and the risk-free investment. So we'll invest X in the stock and Y in the risk-free rate. That's the stock. And this is the risk-free investment. Very simple, simple system of linear equations. Solve it. X star is minus 0, 0.4444 and Y star is 50.5. Means you go short in the underlying and you buy the risk-free investment. This portfolio must have the same price for the portfolio just as for the put today, so P0, the price of the put, is 100 times X star plus Y star. There's a star missing here. And this is 6.06. .06. Very simple. Okay. So we've successfully priced the put. Because it's very simple market. Now those two probabilities we've seen before. Q1 and 1 minus, uh, Q and 1 minus Q. They can be interpreted as what we call pseudo risk neutral probabilities. What is risk neutral probability? It's also called martingale pricing. We can risk neutral probability measure here. This is a biggie. Um, risk neutral pricing is a principle in finance and especially in mathematical finance that considers the following. Now assume a market and you want to compute now what should the price of any financial contract be in an arbitrage free market the price of any contract of any financial investment should always be the future cash flows discounted with an appropriate risk adjusted discount rate these risk adjusted discount rates they will differ from one investor to the another why? Because we have different risk aversion. You're risk loving, I'm risk neutral, you're risk averse. So we'll have different understandings of risk and we would be willing to pay different prices for one investment because we have different risk attitudes. Now, this is how pricing should look like. Everyone has a risk attitude, a different risk attitude. Everyone will use a different risk adjusted discount factor and then he or she will use and take the future cash flows, discount the future cash flows and get the price. Now, one could do the other way. One could, instead of taking the future cash flows, discounting it with the risk-free rate and adding or subtracting a risk adjustment to it, which would be investor specific, it would be very interesting and very nice if we were able to just incorporate the information on the risk attitudes into the probabilities such that in the end all prices are equal to the expected discounted future cash flows. And this can be done in mathematical finance and this is what is called risk neutral pricing. Risiko neutrale Bewertung ist die Vorgehensweise, dass Sie die Wahrscheinlichkeiten nehmen, die Information über die Risikoneigung aller Investoren in die Wahrscheinlichkeiten einbauen Dementsprechend letztlich aus den physischen, so nennt man die auch physischen Wahrscheinlichkeiten, künstliche, und diese künstlichen nennt man dann risikoneutrale Wahrscheinlichkeiten, bastelt, sodass sich am Ende alle Wertpapiere als Preise in ihren Preisen ergeben, als erwartete zukünftige Cashflows, diskontiert mit dem Risikolosen Zinssatz. 
Weil der risikolose Zinssatz ist dann der, den Sie bei Risikoneutralität annehmen würden. Und das nennt sich risikoneutrale Bewertung. Das ist ganz, ganz äh, bedeutend in der Finanzmathematik und auch in den Aktuarswissenschaften. Weil Sie nämlich, anstatt dass Sie einfach die Zahlung nehmen, mit dem risikolosen Zinssatz ähm, diskontieren und dann aber noch eine Risikoprämie hinzurechnen müssen oder abziehen müssen, je nachdem, ob Sie risikoavers oder risikofreundlich sind, freudig sind, ist das dann der Vorteil, dass Sie einfach alles mit dem risikolosen Zinssatz bepreisen können, bewerten können, diskontieren können, Erwartungswert bilden und dann haben Sie den Preis. Sie müssen halt nur vorher die Wahrscheinlichkeiten anpassen. And this is what risk-neutral pricing entails and this is how you suddenly change the physical probabilities into what we call risk-neutral probabilities. Okay. And you can do the same here. One period model can be extended to a multi-period model. In this case, again, the auction extends over two periods and the stock price can go up and down again. And we now are given a call option with a term of two periods and a strike of 90. At time one, the value of the option can be determined for both SU and SD and then we calculate the option price, the two possible option prices at T1, and then go back even further one period in time and calculate the option price in T0. And we get this price here. So let's go back. This is the, uh, the underlying price. And then we calculate CD here and CD here, and then we calculate C0. So the extension of the binomial model to multi-periods is quite simple. You only need to do it more and more and more and more times. They can be duplicated in this case, and if you do it again, for example, in this case with two periods, you get an option price that is 28. Now, let's do this again with risk-neutral approach. For a call option, risk-neutral pricing says, for any security, risk-neutral pricing says, the price should be equal to the expected discounted future cash flows under the risk-neutral probability measure, unter dem wahrscheinlichkeitsneutralen, risikoneutralen Wahrscheinlichkeitsmaß. That's C0, or CT with a conditional expectation. For the binomial lattice process, for this model, Q and 1 minus Q are given by these two probabilities. 1 plus R minus V over U minus V, U minus 1 plus R over U minus D. And again, if you want to know how you can, how you can come up with this tr uh, conversion formula for the physical probabilities, D and U are the physical probabilities, uh, you can look it up in the textbook. And then we have these two probabilities. And the option price should be Q times payment 1 plus 1 minus Q times payment 2 and then discounted. The probability here for the stock price after T periods to be, let's say, S t equal to 155 or something like that, is the probability that the stock has started at S and then gone up uh, j times, and then it can only have gone down t minus j times. Ja? Der Aktienkurs fängt bei S an, und wenn er j, äh, nee, ja, doch j mal hochgegangen ist, kann er nur noch t minus j mal runtergegangen sein. Ja? Und das ist dann die Wahrscheinlichkeit hier, This is uh, the, it's a binomial probability. That's why the model is called binomial model. Yeah, it's, a bin, it's a binom Wahrscheinlichkeit, a Wahrscheinlichkeit einer Binomialverteilung. Keine, keine große Überraschung. Sie haben ein Uhrenmodell, Sie haben rote und schwarze Kugeln drin und wenn Sie zehn Kugeln rausziehen und Sie haben schon fünf rote Kugeln rausgezogen, na, wie viele schwarze Kugeln können maximal noch kommen? Ja, fünf. So. Also binomiale Wahrscheinlichkeit, Binomialverteilung, The maximum 
uh, the payout actually of the call again is maximum of SD minus X or zero. So we have what? C zero is discount factor. This is the discount factor. This here is the probability and this is the cash flow. Cash flow, probability, discount factor. And that's the auction price and the risk move of pricing. Just the expected value of the future discounted cash flows. Erwartungswert bilden der diskontierten Zahlen. Oder den Erwartungswert diskontieren ist das gleiche. Or if you are looking for the auction price somewhere between zero and capital T, so not zero, but in T, well, you can only have gone up J times, or you can, you can only go up J minus T times, and then you can only go down T minus J minus T times. Now it's slightly different, but still the same. Now let's first define a in the following way. A is A dash if it's a natural number or you round it down plus one if it's not a natural number. Das darunter nennt sich übrigens Gausche Klammer. Wenn wir also eine Funktion definieren, die auf diese Art und Weise aus irgendeiner beliebigen Zahl eine natürliche ganze Zahl macht. And a dash is given by the natural logarithm of x divided by sd times d to the t minus t power, uh, yeah, capital T minus t power, divided by the logarithm of u over d. Why? We set a dash like this. It becomes clear if you look at this down here. In this case, see this here, the change. We have a here, j equal to a, we had j equal to zero here, and the other change is no maximum function here. So by setting equal to a, the maximum function disappears. So this is very deep, this is very nice for computation. <laughs> And then we have the option price, CT, that looks like this. I told you that this is a binomial distribution, so let's use the binomial distribution, set B, A, N, P. This is a simple earn model, taking um, A, I think it's drawing A balls out of N balls with a probability of P having P percent of red balls in the earn. Ja? Einfaches Urnenmodell, Binomialwahrscheinlichkeit, A Kugeln aus einer Kugel ziehen mit N Kugeln insgesamt und einer Wahrscheinlichkeit für die erste Sorte von P Prozent ist B A N P, kennen Sie? And Q tilt, we need to slightly rewrite this, only take it as a given. What is interesting now is if we set all these notation like this, the result will be a general pricing formula for a call option in the binomial model. The call price is given by ST times binomial distribution minus strike minus discount factor times binomial distribution. Does anyone see something in this formula? And this is no coincidence. almost the same as the black scholes pricing formula. The only difference is the continuous discount factor is now a discrete discount factor and the binomial distribution is replaced by the normal distribution which is also not a big surprise because in statistics if you if you take the discrete binomial distribution it will converge um, to the normal distribution. 
ist letztlich das Gleiche. Das Binomialmodell ist ein Spezialfall des black scholes modells Und für welchen Spezialfall? For n to infinity. If you not use five steps, if you not use 20 steps, but if you were to use an infinite number of steps in time, then the binomial model converges to the black scholes model. And this is interesting. Because in, in the end, the black scholes model is a conceptually very simple model. It assumes that the stock price can go up and can go down. You can calculate the option price using this very simple model, simply based on the idea that you duplicate the option price using the risk-free rate and the underlying. And it, it, in the end, it's just a net present value idea. Yeah, so risk neutral pricing is nothing but, in the end, um, present net present value idea. Hmm? And if you just increase the number of steps of your discretization strategy, you will come up with the black scholes point. So this is very interesting. Now the relative upward movement u, in this case, is defined by the exponential function of sigma times square root of h, where h is um, the interval you are taking from step one to step two and so on. And d is one over u. So u and d is one over u. And this is the black scholes option price. Now, We've already learned that an option on an underlying with two possible future states can be priced using this formula, risk neutral pricing. Let's now generalize this as follows. So F0 is probability times upper state plus one minus P, lower state and continuously discounted. And P is risk pseudo risk neutral probability. And U and D again are those probabilities for the upper and the lower state. Then, we've seen in the limiting case, we get the black scholes model. It's a discretization strategy because we have time and we cut up time in discrete steps. For example, if you have one year and you use 12 steps, you will have one month interval. And this is different from the black scholes model in which we have infinite, infinitesimally small changes in time. The Black Scholes model is a model in continuous time, a model in stetiger Zeit mit winzigsten infinitesimal kleinen Zeitabständen. Das binomial Modell ist ein diskretes Modell, weil es letztlich einfach sagt, ich nehme den Zeitraum bis zu t und unterteile das in n Schritte. Kann also bei einem Jahr und zwölf Schritten heißen jeden Monat. Okay. And you can use binomial, you can use trinomial lattice processes. And then you can use Monte Carlo simulation and also finite differences to solve for this. And let's first look at binomial lattice process um, with the example of u equal to 1 over d. So if you go, by the way, the difference is it could have also looked like this. And these two here would not be equal. But if you set u equal to 1 over d and you multiply all those probabilities, you can see that again, these two points, they will be the same, they will be s again. And this is a simplification. So s goes up and it goes down and then it will be s again. So this is a binomial lattice. Now, We can look at this from a slightly different angle. Um, remember that we used a Brownian motion, a geometric Brownian motion for our um, underlying price. Now, in order for the binomial tree to approximate this continuous process as best as possible, we have to select some parameters. 
and the binomial lattice model must therefore be calibrated as best as possible. Starting point is st or st plus delta after a certain time interval has lapsed. The log returns logarithm of st plus delta t over st they are normally distributed. We've seen this under the assumption of a geometric Brownian motion for the prices and the Brownian motion for the um, returns. We have a normally distributed log returns. Okay. Now, therefore, we have the following. The expected value of the relative change in price is given by the exponential function of r times delta t. And the variance of this relative price change is given by the second expression. These two conditions, they should be met on the binomial lattice process. So for this process to approximate geometric Brownian motion as best as possible, we need to have this in place. And then we can choose a third condition. And for this, we set u equal to 1 over d. And we could have also used a different choice of one, u. One could have also said u is equal to 0 0.5, 50%. 50% 50 up, 50% down. Then we would get a different model. But here we said u equal to 1 over d. Then for the binomial model, we get the expected future price of the stock is pu times st plus 1 minus pd plus st. And if we all combine this together, the two expected values, so again, this is the geometric Brownian motion. This is the binomial model. And this here and this here is equal. So what we do is we simply multiply this with st. Actually, we have done this here. So multiply this mal st, then we'll get the expectation of st plus delta t, yada, yada, yada. And this has to be equal to this. This is meant by calibrating the binomial lattice process to the geometric Brownian motion. We want the model to look as best as possible, just like the geometric Brownian motion. And for this to be the case, at least expected value and variance should be the same. Relativ einfache Überlegung. Wir wollen die geometrische Branche Bewegung, die wir jetzt schon aus dem Black Scholes Modell kennen, als schönes, stetiges Modell. Das wollen wir annähern. Wir kennen den Erwartungswert und die Varianz für den Prozess im stetiger Zeit, also für die geometrische Branche Bewegung. Wir können das auch ausrechnen in Abhängigkeit von P und U auf dem binomial Gitterprozess Und dann setzen wir einfach beides gleich und wählen dann die übrigen Parameter so, damit das, dass das matcht. And this is what we've done here. PU times ST plus 1 minus PD plus ST is equal, equal to this. And this gives you this. And this is how you can come up with the risk-neutral probability, the pseudo-risk-neutral probability. But this is only the case for the expected value. Das war jetzt nur den Erwartungswert. Jetzt müssen wir noch die Varianz auf beiden Modellen so angleichen, dass Binomialgitterprozess die geometrische Branche Bewegung möglichst gut approximiert. So, variance has to equal this and so on. And it's a lot of algebra. We equalize the two equations. And then in the end, you get the following. We get u over d and so on and we need to make an expansion here and this is the final result u is equal to the exponential function of sigma times the square root of delta t this is the crr model i would assume that if you take a textbook on option pricing maybe half a page after the black scholes price you will see the cox Ross Rubinstein model, the CRR model, the Cox Ross Rubinstein model. It is the model that assumes the pseudo risk neutral probability, P, just like this. And this will give you 
under the assumption that u is equal to 1 over d, this will give you these two equations for u and d. You can do the different, you can do it differently. You can assume that you take p, the probability, and set it to 1 half, 50%. And in that case, you will get slightly different and more complicated expressions for u and d. It is almost equivalent to the cox ross rubinstein model. It only assumes a different probability for the up and down state. It simply assumes 50% up, 50% down. Then you will get slightly different u's and d's. Okay. But also a binomial model. And then now, in the end, let's do this in MATLAB. And let's, I want to show you how actually very simple this is to implement on a computer. We'll take a European plain vanilla call with strike and current stock price 50, 10% risk-free rate, volatility is 40%, and we're looking at a maturity of half a year, 0 0.5. Now for the moment, because it's a European plain vanilla call, we can assume that the actual price under these market assumptions is given by the Black Skulls price. And that would be 6.1165. Is this the true price? No, we don't know this. We would need to observe this in the market. But if the market is arbitrage free, if it fulfills all those assumptions, well, then this should be the arbitrage free price. <laughs> Delta T, we do a discretization in monthly steps. So Delta T is one. 12. U is given by this, D is equal to 1 over U, and the pseudo risk neutral probability is 50.73%. So let's do this. Um, this is the binomial lattice process. We have six steps. We start at 50, and it go up, can go up and down, up, up and down again, and so on, and so on. And you could do what we've done before with the one period and two period model. You can just calculate all those option payouts and go back in time. In fact, that's actually what we are doing. This is the payout column, and you go back in time, and you will get a price of six, 0.36. Now, the last column of the binomial tree for option pricing contains payments of the option according to the payoff profile as expiration, and the option prices in earlier times are then determined recursively. You only take those prices, multiply them with this risk neutral probability P and 1 minus P discount it and this will give you the option price 6.36 when we compare it to the black scotts price of 6.1165 there's a difference why is there a difference because we've only used six steps if we were to include or if we were to increase the number of steps say to 60 to 100 to 1000 the price from the binomial model would get closer and closer to the black scores price because as we've seen the binomial model converges to the black scores model if we increase uh, the time number of time intervals now to implement this in matlab let fij be the option price in note ij so again for example here this is f I1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is F26, uh, F36, and so on. And this is obviously F11. And N is the number of interval divisions up to the due date T. Uh, variable J designates the event J times delta T, so that's the period in time. Variable i, the ith node at the event j, we come from bottom to the top. Actually, I've done it the wrong way. We are going up, down, 
and back in time. Then at maturity, again, we know what the option pays out. And for the periods before that, if we have the pseudo risk neutral probability, everything before that is simply the expected value of this counter or the discounted expected value of future cash flow. So F I plus one, J plus one, and F I J plus one multiplied by the probabilities P and one minus P and then discounted with the exponential function. This is what it looks like in MATLAB. We'll define a function that we'll call lattice, your call, or a European call, based on a binomial lattice process. As input variables, we have S0, K, R, T, sigma, and N. Delta N is T over N. U, D, and P. Well, this is given from the cost. Cox Ross Rubinstein model. Then the lattice is nothing but a matrix. Actually, the matrix looks like this, but will only fill this area here. And this here is what? It fills the last column. And then we'll go through the matrix from right to left, from bottom to top, use these two values, multiply them with P and 1 minus P. This is done here and here. Take the expected value, discount it, and calculate this value. Then we'll use these two and calculate this one here and so on and then we'll use this and what is the option price in the end matrix one one matrix entry at point one one first row first column we could have also used a triangle, but in a computer, you will not have a data structure that is in a triangular form. You will use a matrix. Mm -hmm. And this is, not, well, how, this is how simple it's done in MATLAB. You only need to compute the pseudo risk neutral probability. You will need to know that in the Cox Ross Rubinstein model, using the pseudo risk neutral probability, the price of the option is nothing but the discounted expected value of future cash flows is it risk neutral pricing and then you can calculate it on a computer and this is done here we will use five steps it will give you 6.3595 we'll use 500 steps and 1000 steps and in the end you can see that the option price from the binomial model converges to the 6.1136 i think it was um, from the black scholes price that's option valuation using the binomial model. This simple prog program here does the following. Um, we compare the black scholes price, we'll plot it as a line, and we'll compare the binomial prices for an increasing number of time intervals. And this is the result. You will see that the price of the binomial model only after, let's say, 15 or 20 intervals converges almost to the black scholes price, but it, the convergence is actually very small because it starts to fibrillate around the black scholes price. So even though one could also say, at least here with 50 time intervals, it's already very good. But don't expect too much when increasing the number of time intervals, the discretization steps from 50 to 100. There will not be too much of an improvement in the accuracy here um, because it, it oscillates around the black scholes price. Okay. One can improve this. Um, this is uh, quite simple. Um, 
you don't need to save all of this information in such a matrix. As you might have noticed, we have this value, we have this here, this one here, and this one here, and it's, it's almost the same. It's always the same. So instead of matrix, you only need 11 values. And you can increase the efficiency of your program by noting this and then by improving on this. Okay. This is a smart version of this program. It doesn't use, uh, first of all, it doesn't use a matrix. And second, it does all those computations that are done every time in the for loop, like the computation of the probability and the probability times the discount factor, it singles this out and puts it before the loop. Otherwise, you will do an extra bunch of work every time in the loop and the values are always the same. You know, the discount factors don't change. They can be, be uh, computed beforehand and it will be done here instead of here where it's done in the for loop. Just a uh, very efficient way to, to improve this program. But otherwise, it will be the same computation. Okay. And then we'll have this one here. You can look through it, and this is very, very neat. The next part will deal with the trinomial model. But I would suggest that we stop here. Do you have any questions concerning the binomial model? Any questions at all? Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions, thank you for your attention and see you next week. Thank you.